like to welcome you to today's distinguished speaker presentation. And it's my honor to introduce our speaker, Edsger W. Dijkstra. Dr. Dijkstra studied mathematics and theoretical physics at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, graduating in 1956. He earned his PhD in computing science at the University of Amsterdam. He was appointed a full professor of mathematics at Eindhoven University of Technology in 1962, and then added work as a research fellow at Burroughs Corporation in 1973. In 1984, Dr. Dijkstra left the Netherlands to accept the Schlumberger Centennial Chair in the Department of Computer Sciences at the University of Texas in Austin. Dr. Dijkstra is known for early graph theoretical algorithms, the shortest path and the shortest spanning tree. The first implementation of Algol 60, completed in August of 1960, the first operating system composed of explicitly synchronized sequential processes, the invention of a number of seminal problems such as mutual exclusion, the dining philosophers, distributed termination detection, and self-stabilization, the invention of guarded commands and of predicate transformers as a means for defining semantics and for programming methodology in the broadest sense of the word. Dr. Dijkstra was elected the first distinguished fellow of the British Computer Society. He was named a member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Science received the 1972 ACM Touring Award, the 1974 AFIPS Harry Good Memorial Award, is a foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and is an honorary Doctor of Sciences of the Queen's University of Belfast. Dr. Dijkstra's current research interests focus on the formal derivations of proofs and programs and the streamlining of the mathematical argument in general. His increasing interest in methodology is reflected in his teaching. Let's give Dr. Dijkstra a warm welcome. clearly works. Um, I thank the organization very much for the invitation and the opportunity to ad address you. I'm particularly honored that I am esteemed sufficiently experienced to be the first one to struggle with the absence of facilities here. Um, <laughs> I should add that when I was asked to give Nalmato a title of my lecture, I coined this one, and I did so before your presidential elections. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Furthermore, uh, I should like to warn you just in case that you're going to be disappointed by my lecture, uh, that will be mainly due not to the poor quality of my lecture, but to your exaggerated expectations. <laughs> and I will s now start immediately with the story. Um, I would like you to uh, understand that I consider mathematics more as a question of how than as a question of what. That is, uh, I consider it uh, primarily as the art and science of reasoning as effectively as possible. Um, to illustrate some of the consequences of this, um, I'm going to show you a number of example problems uh, where the point will be not to waste our time. And the most effective ways of wasting our time is either an exploding case analysis or um, 
a method of trial and error where most of your efforts turn out to be errors. Um, now that's obviously a waste of time and energy and uh, I will show you some examples of uh, how we can avoid those pitfalls. Uh, the more so because the underlying techniques are more or less general. Uh, I will start with uh, a series of very similar problems, some of which you might even know. They will be given to small children. And here we are. Um, as you see, this is a river. It flows this way, and this is the left shore, and this is the right shore. And all here is water. Yeah? And uh, the problem, uh, uh, the kind of problems I'm going to solve is that uh, with a little boat, something has to be transported from the left shore to the right shore under different constraints. Uh, now, uh, for all my solutions, uh, which will consist of a sequence of moves, in which the ship, the, the little boat moves up and forth, uh, I will impose one constraint, and that is that in my final solution will not occur a sequence of moves, the net effect of which is nil. So I will not allow a sequence of moves that could have been omitted. Uh, I'm adding for the shortest solution. In particular, uh, I will not uh, admit the simplest case of this, and that is two successive moves, the second one of which undoes the effect of the first one. Now, uh, my first problem Yes. Uh, my first problem consists uh, of a shepherd, there's a little boat here to begin with, and there arrives a shepherd in the company of three objects, to wit a wolf, a goat, and a cabbage. And uh, his boat is so small that he can carry only with him one of the objects from the left shore to the right shore. So he has to transport them in turn. However, the problem is that uh, if the shepherd is not there to prevent it, the wolf would eat the goat. Secondly, if the shepherd is not there to prevent it, the goat would eat the cabbage. And the target of the whole exercise is that uh, we reach the other, the shepherd reach the other side of the river with nothing consumed by the partners. Now, uh, the first remark is that the problem as stated is over specific in the sense that in the in the, the, it says that the wolf eats the goat. But the, only, the moral of the story, and the only thing that matters, is that the wolf, wolf and the goat are not, will not be left together in the absence of the shepherd. It would, equal, would be equally fatal if the goat would eat the wolf. That wouldn't change the rules of the game. Still, they are not allowed to be together. Exactly the same thing it would be if, uh, in his absence, the cabbage would eat the goat. That is, if we have the goat, it should not be, the goat should not be left with either the wolf or the cabbage, but the situation is to now totally symmetric in wolf and cabbage, and we, we just call him an alf alpha. The shepherd arrives with a goat and two alphas, and the goat should not be left alone with an alpha. 
and the fact that uh, the one is a goat, uh, that the one alpha is a wolf and the other is, is a cabbage is totally irrelevant. Now, uh, as soon as uh, we have this symmetric situation, we don't need to distinguish between uh, the two alphas anymore. Now, uh, and he here we start. We start at the left-hand side with uh, two alphas and a goat. Now, the only thing you can do, can the shepherd can do, he cannot take an alpha with him. Sorry, uh, he cannot. He cannot go all by himself to the other side because then the only next move is undoing that. So he has to take at least something. He can take at most one thing. He cannot take an alpha, because then an alpha and a goat would, would be left at the left shore. So the only thing he can do is to take the goat. So now the goat is here, and the alpha squared are there. The only thing, he, the, the, only thing the, sh the shepherd can do is go back all by himself. Next thing, he has no choice. There are only uh, he he cannot go back empty again because then he would undo the previous move. So he has to take something with him. So he has to take the alpha, an alpha. Yeah. Now there are here a gamma and an alpha. And there is an alpha here. What does he has, what does he have to do on the trip back? He has no choice. He cannot leave these two. He cannot take the alpha because he would undo it. So he has to take the gamma. And the net effect is alpha. And now uh, the, the goat and the alpha are there. Now, now, and now it's, it's very simple, of course, because the next move is that you take an alpha, and then there's a gamma here, and there's an alpha squared. You go empty here, and you take the gum, take the goat, and you have gamma uh, goat. Why I make my goat Greek, I don't know. But <laughs> here we are. Notice that thanks to omitting the difference between the goat and the cabbage, our solution has become in e you, sorry, the, the wolf and the cabbage, uh, and in the introduction of the abstract concept of an alpha, our solution has become unique. Not only has it become unique, uh, it also has become symmetric, you see. Goat to the right, empty to the left, alpha to the right, goat to the left. And you see that this situation is reproduced here and this situation is reproduced there. This symmetry is also only there, provided you ignore the difference between the two alphas. First problem. Uh, all little Dutch children know this. Uh, it is even, there, there is even a Dutch saying, uh, trying to spare simultaneously the goat and the cabbage. I mean, it's, we use it in having your cake and eat it. But it's not, not a well-known problem in the United States, I guess. Did you, did you know it? Oh, you knew. Okay, so some of you knew it. Okay. Um, now, uh, here our solution was um, essentially abstraction, ignoring differences that could be regarded as irrelevant. Uh, next step is um, another technique for uh, reducing case analysis, and that is when you are faced with a problem and something has to be done, and there might be all sorts of ways of achieving it, uh, make the problem harder. Impose more constraints on the solution. And, uh, instead of you allow yourself to walk, I mean, you have to, yeah? You do something difficult. Uh, now, the, the net effect of such additional constraints, well, I, either it can't be done at all anymore, 
you have made it impossible. Well, that's a pity. Uh, or it's just possible, but only in one way. Now, uh, I would like to show you an example of that problem. Uh, this time, uh, at the left hand, there comes uh, come two couples, uh, a wife and a husband, and there's also a lowercase couple, a wife and a husband. The little boat carries two persons at most, at least one if it is to cross the river. And the rules of the game are, I mean, this is a very sexist problem, but I can't help that. The rules of the game are that a woman, a wife, is not allowed in the company of the other husband unless her own husband is present as well. So, yeah, those are the rules of the game. So, disallowed stages, combinations, are this pair, uh, W, H, and the other wife, that's not allowed either, and then the image, uh, W, H, and W, H, W. Those four situations are not allowed at either side of the, at either shore. Now, uh, you can ask yourself whether you can do this and, 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 and try all sorts of things. Uh, but one of the ways of making it harder and simplifying it, you say, well, I can avoid those four situations by a stronger, much simpler rule. And the simple rule is just keep the guys together. The guys remain together. Then none of these situations can ever emerge. So there you are. So another problem is, how, how do we cross the uh, river if we keep the two guys together? However, that constraint is symmetric in the two, two husbands. To all intents and purposes, they could be the two copies of identical twins. But if we don't distinguish between the males, we don't need to distinguish between the females either. So, uh, here we go. We forget upper and lower case. I say, well, we start with uh, two wives, two wives and two husbands. I shouldn't call them wives and husbands anymore. I, I should call them... Uh, females and males, yeah? And I have two of those and I have two <coughs> of those. Now, what's the, fir what's the first move if you insist on keeping the guys together? Hmm? Both, both. You no, n not either. You see, because if I send two males across, the boat can't go come back all by itself. It can't be done by one male because they have to stay together. So there it would be two males, but then I would undo in my move. So the only thing to do is defeat the two females, and there you have two males and you have two females. The only thing to be done is to have one of the females going back. Now you have here two males and a female. The only thing you can do is not sending the female, 
but the, the two mills, because they have to stick together, and um, where you had an F here, you have now an F here, and uh, M squared F, and you see the same symmetry again from the previous solution, and we can stop. So, uh, now you see what uh, our strengthening has done. Not only has it reduced uh, uh, our degree of freedom, uh, but uh, it also suddenly allowed us to eliminate, to introduce a symmetry which allowed us to eliminate the individual couples and uh, simplify in that way. Okay, we progressed nicely. Uh, now, now my last example uh, on this line, and that is the well-known example of the cannibals and the missionaries. Yeah? Uh, a problem beloved by the artificial intellects. Here come three cannibals and three missionaries, and the boat can contain only two persons. And one of the rules of the game is that um, zero sh uh, no, wait a bit. I'll say it in words. Uh, what is not allowed is that at one of the shores uh, the number of cannibals are uh, that the cannibals are outnumbered by the missionaries, because as soon as you have cannibals and, and there are more missionaries, then the missionaries start to convert the cannibals, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and 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 that should be prevented. I mean, uh, American politics and the confusion with religion in that area makes quite clear that we don't need more conversions. Uh, now the rules of that game, and I will try, try to uh, use the other infernal machine. Yes, there we are. Wait a minute. It even works a little bit. Yeah? No, no, that, that, that's for late, that's for later. I keep the surprise invisible, <laughs> just, just, to just to irritate you. Uh, one of the uh, things I'm, sh I'm showing now is that uh, if you are faced with such a complicated problem, uh, a wise advice is to make a little list of trivial theorems that you get for free. So they are so simple that they are for free. For heaven's sake, write them down. Yeah? Either they are useless, but it didn't cost anything at all to get them, so that didn't, or they, or they help you in finding uh, what you're going to do. Now, the obvious rule is is, is to uh, to check the consequences uh, if the division along the shores is one to five, one at the one side and five at the other, or two against four or three against three. Now, one of the rules is that if the singleton that singleton must be a missionary. You cannot take away one cannibal because then in the remaining five, conversions would take place. Uh, similarly, uh, if you have a 2 4 division, then the pair could con should contain at least one missionary. Because otherwise, in the, in the four, the conversions would take place. Uh, if you have a 3 3 division, the only safe one is to have a triple of missionaries at the one side of the shore and a triple of cannibals at the other. Because if not, then at one of the two sides you would be wrong. So these are our three theorems. Now, lo and behold, again, <coughs> our solution is unique. Uh, I remember uh, as a little kid, uh, six, seven years old or so, I tried to solve this problem and uh, I had checker pieces, three white ones and three black ones. And, uh, 
of course, I didn't record my solution, so uh, e even after I had succeeded, I didn't know what I had done, and I had no way of controlling that there were no cyclic movements. And uh, certainly, I did not recognize that it was essentially only one thing I, you c I could do. Now, on the way out, uh, to begin with, uh, the only way to, to, to you, 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 you cannot send one thing, one, one person to the other side, because then the next move it has, has to undo it. Uh, so two have to go. But that's a pair. It should contain uh, a, uh, a missionary and a don't care. So there it goes. And the next move, that's a question mark, uh, the don't care goes back. Now, again, uh, we have to move two to the other side because if it was one, we could have chosen the don't care to be identical and it would have undone that one. So there we go. And uh, we now we create a triple at the other side. The triple has to be homogeneous. So the only, you have no choice, you have to move uh, the, the two. And get uh, three cannibals to the left and three missionaries to the left, to, to the right. The only thing that you can take to the left that does not undo the previous uh, is one move, is, is one missionary. So there you go. And now you are uh, at a situation that uh, you have four. Now, if you now take, 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 take two to the right, uh, then you leave a pair at the left-hand side. That has to contain a missionary, so that one own missionary has to, has to remain to the left. And the only thing you can do is to carry two, C, two, two uh, cannibals. Uh, now, at the end, uh, now the only thing you can do is uh, take a cannibal and a missionary to the left, and Lo and behold, now again you have that interchange, and then uh, this is the symmetric central move, and you can, uh, you are halfway, and the problem has been solved. Uh, again, our solution is unique, provided that we allow the don't cares. Uh, if you have to specify whether this, uh, your first don't care and your final don't care, is either a missionary or a um, cannibal, then it would be four solutions. But the parameters is one of the, the unspecified parameter is one way of mapping those four solutions on a single one. Um, now the, what this really, this solution really profits from is that we do not distinguish between uh, the identity of the cannibals, hmm? nor the identity of uh, the missionaries. And in our first move, uh, the missionary goes to the... Uh, if the missionaries were named, and we would distinguish the between them, and if there would be uh, Mark, John, and uh, Lucas, then we would have to choose which missionary is crossing the river, uh, not naming them. We just count and say, well, at least one missionary goes her way. Now, that is the uh, general pattern of uh, counting arguments, and that's also their efficiency. Um, you see, in normal, um, primary school education, when children learn to count, hmm, they learn that uh, three apples take away, one apple remains two apples. And next lesson, they learn that three pairs take away one pair, uh, remains two pairs. 
and the next lesson they are elephants, etc. And uh, eventually it is clear that if you are counting, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of things you count, and you can uh, map all these calculations to 3 minus 1, 3 take away 1 is 2. But there is something even much, much more essenti essential. And uh, the trouble is that if you take three apples, yeah, and now you say take away one, you can raise the question, which one? Shall we take away this one so that these two remain? Or shall we take the middle one away? But by the time that we say that 3 minus 1 equals 2, the question which one is clearly meaningless. Yeah? And, 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 the, and the story is twofold. Uh, on the one hand, uh, if you have a number of objects and you cannot distinguish between them, the only thing you can do is to count them. On the other hand, if you have a set of objects and you capture their essence by seeing how many there are, you don't distinguish between the objects. Uh, and th 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 this is no joke. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the popular ways of um, verifying the correctness of programs these days is model checking. Um, however, uh, model checking can only deal comfortably with booleans and cannot deal comfortably with I integers. And therefore, if you have uh, a solution with, uh, which is essentially a congestion problem, if you wish to know how many processes are in what kind of state and, and are possibly interfering, etc. Et, et well, if you take the example of the readers and the writers, I remember that uh, with a fast machine, someone was very proud that he could uh, do two readers and one writer. And a few years later, there were faster machines and slightly more ingenious algorithms. And lo and behold, they could do uh, two writers and three readers. This model checking uh, process uh, is self-defeating in the sense that the number of states that have to be explored grows with the number of competitors in the exponent. So uh, you, the state space that you have to uh, explore uh, really explodes exponentially. And that purely because it's a technique that doesn't count. All solutions for the reader's writer's problem can be solved on the back of an envelope, provided that you're allowed to use arbitrary integers. Okay, now, uh, this was the first part. Uh, now the second part, for the second part I have prepared my foils, because it's a complicated one. Uh, I will solve, or I will prove the same theorem twice. Uh, and uh, I will do that just in order to give you a feeling for the uh, significance of the difference in style in which I prove them. The first proof is combinatorial, the second one is a counting proof. Uh, here we are. Oops. I'm considering what is called a complete six graph that consists of six nodes, which you may call points, and their total number is six. That's what's meant by the six graph. The number of edges, that is the number of pairs, 
equals 6 times 5 over 2 times 1. Yeah, number of pairs, you have <coughs> plus 6 possibilities for the first one, and you have 5 possibilities for the second one, but then you have counted each pair twice. So there you are. There are 15 edges. You can continue, and you should ask how many triangles are there. Well, the triangles are, uh, uh, the total number is 6 times 5 times 4, divided over 3 times 2 times 1, the order in which you could have arranged the... So there are 20 triangles. Now, that is the figure that I am considering in the rest of this talk. Only I add to this that each edge is either red or blue. And thanks to this perfect overhead projector, the colors show. <laughs> um, now I would like you to focus on the 20 triangles. That's a laborious job, but uh, you notice that there are two types of triangles. There is, for instance, FAC, yeah, which has a blue edge, a blue edge, and a red edge. Now that's what I, but that's what I call a bichrome triangle. Yeah, its sides don't all have the same color. Uh, if I look at A, B, D, A, you see that all its sides are red. That's what I call a monochrome triangle. And if you are lucky, you see a second monochrome triangle, also all red. Yeah? Uh, I tell you, these are the only ones in this in this coloring. Yeah. Uh, of course, if I had made all edges red, then I would have t 20 monochrome triangles. Yeah. Now the theorem that I'm going to prove is that no matter how you color the edges, there are at least two monochrome triangles. Uh, here is my illustrations of my terminology. Uh, there are two types of monochrome triangles, all red and all blue. And uh, there are two types of bichrome triangles, uh, mostly red and mostly blue. And in the example the only mon that I showed, the only monochrome triangles were the red A, B, D, and A. This is a summary. I can remove this? Yeah? Okay. Next one. Now, the uh, combinatorial problem or solution uh, proceeds in two stages. First of all, uh, we establish the uh, existence of one monochrome triangle, and after we've done so, then of the second one. Now, the, the, the argument for one monochrome triangle is the following. Uh, focus your attention on node X, because there are five other nodes, five edges meet in X. Since there are only two colors, at least one color occurs at least three times, say red. So there are th we now consider the situation that there are three red edges meeting in X. Now, call the other endpoints A, B, and C. And focus your attention on triangle A, B, and C. If it's all blue, we have found a monochrome triangle, a blue ABC. 
If they are not all blue, triangle ABC has a red edge. Say AC. But if AC is red, then we have found the monochrome XAC. So under all circumstances, if we have only two colors, we have found the existence, we have demonstrated the existence of a monochrome triangle. Everybody agrees? Yeah, you should agree because the next argument is more complicated, you see. <laughs> uh, now we are going to show the presence of a second monochrome triangle. Uh, well, the argument starts as follows. I say, well, we have already, we know already that there is at least one monochrome triangle. Let it be red. We mark its three endpoints with A's. It's three vertices. And the other three points we marked with B's. The original text, by the way, in which uh, I found this argument, marked the three uh, edges by A1, A2, A3, and marked the remaining one, named the other one, with B1, B2, B3, and uh, <coughs> carried these me meaningless uh, arguments all over the place. Now, here we are. I said, let there be a red monochrome triangle, call its nodes A, mark the other three nodes B, and this implies there are three types of edges. There are AA edges, AB edges, and BB edges. There are three AA edges, and they are all red. There are three BB edges, and we don't know. And there are nine AB edges. Yeah? Because each of the three A's can be connected to each of the three B's. The three squared is, is still nine. Now, uh, now I come with a case analysis, uh, and you should read that as follows. If is an opening bracket, first situation, a conclusion. Here is a separator. Second con alternative, here is a conclusion, and then phi is the closing bracket. That's the way uh, here P holds, and here non-P holds, and here I conclude something, and there I conclude something. Yeah? And I do that nested. Here is my outer alternative. And the two cases is there is a B with something, and there is no B with that same thing. Yeah? Now, the first case I'm considering is, that considering is that there is a B where two red ABs meet. Yeah? There is a... Look, look at this configuration, yeah? Now, if there is a B where two red AB edges meet, then I have found my second monochrome triangle. Because the assumption is that the A, all AA edges are red. So if, if there is a B where two <coughs> red AB edges meet, then I found a red AAB. That's my second. Yeah? This is a situation that uh, m the second monochrome triangle shares an edge with the first one. Yeah? Uh, that, by the way, was the situation in the example I showed, uh, the, the, very the very first example. Uh, 
Here I have one red one, and here I have another red one, and they share an edge. That's the situation I'm considering. Uh, now, consider the situation that there is no B where two red AB edges meet. Now, uh, since there are three A's, if there is no B where two red ones meet, then each B has two blue AB edges meeting there. Because at each B, three AB edges meet, and if there are never uh, two red ones, then there are always two blue ones. So f from this fact that there is no B with this, I can conclude that each B has at least two A's, AB edges that are blue. Now, the situation is a little bit more complicated. Uh, now I'm going to have a look at uh, the BB edges. Yeah. Now either there is no blue BB edge, now that means that all BB edges are red, I have found my second monochrome triangle. It's BBB, which is red. Uh, here I have AAA and there I have BBB. So I'm done. Suppose that this is not the case. Well, then there is a blue BB. However, I, I am in a situation that each B, in particular those two, have two different blue AB edges. So there are two blue AB edges meeting at this B, and there are two AB edges meeting at that. However, there are only three A edge, uh, nodes. So this pair and that pair share at least one A edge, one A node, and we have found a blue ABB. So we're done. This is a painful argument. Yeah? Why is it painful? Well, that is because we have to distinguish between the situation that the second one shares the side, the second one shares only a an, an node, and the, third, the, the second one shares nothing. We have to make that case distinction. Uh, another shortcoming of this argument is that it becomes extremely painful if, for instance, we would like to show that in the case of the complete eight graph, I don't know there are probably at least three or at least four monochrome triangles. I mean, the, the, you, you, you see the com combinations exploding that's clearly not a way of doing it. Now, uh, as I told you, the text f from which I have, uh, for in which I found this argument, uh, uh, complicated matters by uh, labeling the A's as A1, A2, A3, and the same thing with the B's, and then struggling with um, those subscripts, uh, the trick of simplification, of course, is by not forming irrelevant, not introducing irrelevant distinctions. Now, the argument, the combinatorial argument that I showed to you, uh, has everything wrong with it. Uh, my very first argument was on the, on, the, on the previous foil. I said, uh, well, focus our attention on uh, node X. Now, as soon as you name 
one of the six nodes, you destroy the complete symmetry between the six nodes. Yeah. Uh, so we should find an argument in which no nodes are named explicitly. If we wish to exploit the symmetry between the nodes of the complete six graph. <coughs> then we concluded that uh, at least three of those five edges would have the same color, and I said, say red, thereby destroying the symmetry and the colors. You see, the, the whole problem statement uh, is the same if you, it remains the same if you uh, interchange uh, red and blue. The whole concept of bichrome and monochrome is, is not dependent on either red or blue. Uh, we must find an argument in which we do not mention the individual colors. Because as soon as you do that, I say red, yeah, you destroy the symmetry between the colors. So we had better head for an argument that doesn't mention uh, individual nodes and that does not mention um, the individual colors either. Now, if you're, n if you're not allowed to say red or blue, the simplest remark you can make that still ma does justice to the fact that there are two colors in the game is that if you consider a pair of edges, they either have the same color or are of different color. Now, the question is, suppose that we are talking about pairs, pairs of edges, and we would like to consider pairs of the same, pairs of different color, homogeneous or monochrome or mixed, yeah? So what is the simplest concept? Well, the simplest concept is not the homogeneous, the mono is not the monochrome pair, because there are two types of monochrome pairs, there's the all blue pair and the all red pair. However, the, the, the mixed pair, one red and one blue, there is only one of them. So we are considering pairs of different colors. Secondly, because we talk about the uh, complete uh, six graph, somewhere the topology uh, has to be taken into account. I do so by focusing my attention on pairs that have a node in common. And the central concept I'm going to talk about is therefore the mixed V. A mixed V is a pair of differently colored edges that meet in one point. And uh, I, I, I need a verb, uh, and they are supported by the point in which they meet. So that's my concept. I'm trying to reason in terms of mixed fees. Yeah? Now there are two theorems, two very simple theorems. The first one is that um, each node supports at most six mixed fees. You see? <coughs> if all five edges that meet in that point have the same color, there is no mixed fee at all. Yeah? 
if the color division is one of the one color and four of the other, then I can form four mixed Vs, because the one of the one color can be combined with any of the remaining four. However, if the division is as equal as possible, uh, two of the one color and three of the other color, then I can, in six ways, select two edges of a different color. So the theorem is that uh, a node supports at most six mixed Vs, where six is formed as two times three. That is when two of its meeting edges have one color and the remaining three the other. So there we are. The other remark is that if we look at a bichrome triangle, I can form three, select three Vs by omitting one of the sides. The, the other two sides form a V. If I take a bichrome triangle, then one V is monochrome and two of them are bichrome. Yeah. Uh, the ones meeting at the bottom, that they are of different color, and the ones at the top are of the same color. Now, since each V already contains four edges, it, it, it uh, is a three node, it determines the triangle in which it lies uniquely. And therefore, those two mixed Vs occur nowhere else. And the moral of the story is that no matter how you color, the number of mixed Vs is twice the number of bichrome triangles. Each bichrome triangle absorbs three mixed Vs. A monochrome triangle had, has, doesn't contain any, doesn't contain mixed Vs at all because uh, it's homogeneous. So the number of mixed Vs is twice the number of bichrome triangles. Now that's quite general. And now we go. Our proof obligation, the top line, is the Boolean statement that a number of monochrome triangles is at least two. That was the theorem we had to prove. Now remember from the ver my very first foil, the total number of triangles is 20. And since each triangle is, is bichrome or monochrome, if the statement that the number of monochrome triangles is at least two is equivalent to the statement that the number of bichrome triangles is at most 18, 20 minus two. But our previous corollary says that uh, the number of bichrome triangles is half the number of the by the bichrome V. So uh, thanks to the corollary, that statement is uh, equivalent to the remark that the number of mixed Vs is at most 36. Now, each mixed V is supported by a node. There are six nodes. <coughs> so that the, to the total number of mixed Vs is at most 36 follows from the still unproven fact that each node supports at most six of them. But that was lemma zero. Each node supports at most six mixed fees, and Lemma Zero says that that is true. <coughs> so here we are. And notice that this second argument 
much less laborious than uh, the case analysis we uh, struggled with beforehand. Secondly, uh, it is quite straightforward to uh, generalize this um, argument to smaller or larger graphs. If you do this, try try this on the uh, complete five graph, you'll dis you'll discover that there need not be uh, monochrome triangles at all. And another illustration is that <coughs> shows shows from this example, the, this argument that. Um, you get the uh, minimum number of monochrome triangles, provided that you make as many mixed uh, fees as, as possible. And that you get if at each node you support as many uh, mixed fees as possible which happens if two are of the one color and three are of the other color. Here is my original graph, and this is one with uh, two, with only two monochrome triangle, and you look at the six points, and you see that uh, the color frequencies at each net is two of the one color and, five for, and three of the other. as it should. If the distribution was not so equal, there would have been more monochrome triangles. I think this was a wonderful piece of timing. Uh, if you wish to shoot at the pianist, this is the moment to do it. Uh, are there any questions, remarks, objections, questions about other things? Uh, yes, sir. I'm not sure whether this is a remark or a suggestion. It seems uh, plausible that the, it's in some other theorem, like the eight graph or something, that the counting arguments might only be able to uh, sure. Sure. Uh, uh, I have not demonstrated that uh, the count counting argument gives the sharpest bound. Uh, it does. But uh, that's a more complicated argument. It is. I did not write it down uh, because um, I had to distinguish between um, an even number of points and an odd number of points. But you're right. doesn't prove everything. <laughs> Other questions? Other remarks? Yes, sir. Um, 
with the counting argument, uh, with, with count, counting included, um, <coughs> you have a state space, uh, um, but instead of it consisting of many booleans, it consists of uh, much fewer uh, integers, natural numbers as, as a rule. Um, and um, the exploration of that state space uh, <coughs> can be done, th which is in number of variables much smaller, uh, can profit from the fact that um, we can calculate these in th there are theorems about those integers. Hmm? For instance, uh, if each element, uh, you, if, if each component can be in five different states, yeah? and you count the number of components in the first state and the number of components in the second state, etc., you have the theorem that the sum of those numbers is constant because that's the total number of components. Yeah? Now, that's a very simple conservation rule, uh, but uh, uh, there might be also a sort of transitions from, from here till there, and uh, you might be able to write down inequalities, and uh, you have the whole, and, and, and that is what makes the uh, arguments so much shorter. Um, you're still exploring a state space, but do it several orders of magnitude more effectively. Yeah. Particularly without explosion. Yeah. Because um, it's almost certain that you will use the fact that uh, addition is associative. Yeah. A plus B plus C equals A plus B plus C. Irrespective of how big A, B, and C are. That's one of the nice things of the associativity of, 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 of uh, addition. It holds for all integers. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I'm not a practical man, of course. <laughs> uh, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, an eye for the limitations of uh, model checking. Uh, and the other hint, uh, the hint that if you look at a number of components and uh, there is no point in distinguishing between them, that in that case, counting is the thing to be done. Um, I find um, counting arguments uh, surfacing at uh, what perhaps are most unexpected places, but um, in the construction of formal proofs. For instance, um, in the case that uh, a function f distributes over the minimum, that is, the f of for the minimum, I take a downward arrow, yeah? The f of the minimum of x and y is the minimum of the f of x and the f of y. This may be given for a function f, yeah? In that case, f is monotonic. That is, x at most y implies the f of x is at most the f of y. 
That's a theorem. Now, if you wish to prove this theorem, what you really have to do is to start with this Boolean expression, and by consecutive weakening, you have to construct this one. Or you start the other way around. You start with your uh, uh, demonstrandum. Fx is at most Fy. And by possibly strengthening it, you have to transform it into um, x less than y. Now, if you look at, forget about these parentheses, I mean, that, that, was, a, that was a mistake, sorry. f of x at most, the f of y follows from x at most y. Yeah? Now you start here and you have to end up there. The only thing you have to do is to get rid of those two f applications. So in terms of number of symbols occurring in your expression, you have to find a transformation that removes two f applications. You have to use this one, yeah? Because that's, that's given and that's essential. Well, that occurs the has the downward arrow. You can only use it if you introduce the downward arrow at least once. Yeah? So downward arrows have to uh, enter the game somehow. Any downward arrow that has been introduced has to be removed again. Because in the final form, it doesn't take. And uh, you can just. It's almost like balancing a checkbook. Yeah? It's quite clear that um, this formula all by itself will never remove the last f application. You see? You have to get rid of two f applications, but, uh, well, this can only. This equates an expression with two f applications to an expression with one f application. So you can get rid of one. However, f occurs at both sides of the equality, and therefore you can never get rid of the last one by a rewrite rule. So just counting the number of symbols, the, change that ha the changes that have to be made, um, will lead you to the proof. Um, I used that uh, to prove two theorems uh, from a, a book by Alfred Tarski on logic, and two theorems on group theory, which he included in his book as more complicated examples. Just by using uh, this counting technique, uh, I proved his simpler example, and his more complicated example, I even came up with a simpler proof than uh, Tarski's. No. Uh, Perhaps you don't think this important. If Tarski has already proved it, uh, why come up with a shorter proof? Um, well, to say the honest truth, uh, in the combination of theorem and proof, uh, I usually think the proof of greater cultural significance than the theorem. Yeah? It's totally fantastic if you realize that uh, several centuries before Christ, uh, Euclid and his friends took the trouble of proving that the number of prime numbers, number of primes was unlimited before they knew that, uh, I mean, there were enough primes for their needs. Yeah? But they took the problem, that they, they took the trouble 
to show with a beautiful argument that it is shining gem from antiquity that the number of primes is unbounded. Yeah? And it's my private definition of a reusable theorem. It's a theorem that can be proved over and over again. Yes, sir. It is a time-honored rule of thumb. Never destroy symmetry lightly. Sometimes you have to. Yeah? But never destroy symmetry lightly. And there, there is that terrible thing. If all traffic keeps one side of the road, if every, everybody keeps the right side of the road, then oncoming traffic doesn't clash. Yeah? If everybody takes the left-hand side of the road, it's okay as well. So we end up with a world in which half, half of the traffic has made the one choice and part of it has... Yeah? Um, The fact that we do not have a good notation for the unordered pair <coughs> may force us to quite arbitrarily introduce the one versus the other. Tremendous nuisance that we do not have them. Shall we call it a long Tuesday? Yeah? Okay. Thank you for your attention.